Welcome back to the last hour of a special Educators Amplified gubernatorial edition. Give yourselves a round of applause for coming out and hanging out today. All right, I'm going to turn it right back over to Mr. Tim Slecker. Thank you, Earl. Educators Amplify. I appreciate it. Hey, this is Tim Slecker from Busted Pencils, Fully Leaded Education Talk, every Saturday morning at 11 a.m. on WRRD Resistance Radio. So candidates, welcome to the last hour. We would like to start off with having each of you introduce yourselves and have about one minute to talk to us about why you're here and why does education matter to you? Thank you very much. I'm uh, Matt Flynn, candidate for governor, Democrat. I want to introduce two people who are here with me today for my campaign. Dr. Pam Malone of MATC. Dr. Malone is an educator and advises me on education issues. And uh, Brian Kennedy, the former uh, head of the American Federation of Teachers in Wisconsin, is my campaign manager. Brian, I'm glad you're here as well. Um, by way of background, my wife, Mary, and I have been married 41 years, and Mary is a lifetime WEAC member. She is a speech therapist in uh, the Germantown School District for almost 30, over 30 years. And my father uh, was on the faculty at the University of Wisconsin-Milwaukee for more than 30 years also. I come from an education family, and there's no more important issue than education in this state. And I'm looking forward to this, and I want to thank Jim Carlson and Earl Ingram for, for putting this on. Uh, I am running quite simply because I think um, our democracy has been betrayed in Washington by Donald Trump, who has betrayed us to the Russians for bribery and blackmail and dividing us racially and ethnically, and in Madison by Scott Walker, who's betraying us to his donors and the yeah. Koch brothers. I'm looking forward to all of the questions here today. Thank you Thank very you. much. Andy? Just a brief introduction. Okay. Hey. Hi, everybody. I'm Andy Gronick. First, let me apologize for being late, but let me tell you why. We are taking the fight directly to Scott Walker. We were just coming from the Wisconsin Center, where the Republican Party convention has been going for three days. We were there all day yesterday, we're there all day today, and we will be there all day tomorrow. In Scott Walker's face, with a billboard that calls him out for all of the kinds of special purpose money that he's been taking for the last eight years at the expense of everybody in the state of Wisconsin. That okay. billboard's parked right out front here because he's the guy that brought me over to the conference. Okay. Here, here's the bottom line. I am here because I'm tired of our state being upside down. We've got a governor that's turned education upside down, that's turned wages upside down, health care upside down. I'm the business guy in this race. I'm an entrepreneur. I built one of the largest businesses of its type in the world helping struggling companies that couldn't go to a bank and get a conventional all, bank loan. All right. All right. Thank you very much for that. Right. Let's, let's get started. Okay, so, right. This, we're hoping this to be conversational and educational about education. So my name is Joanna Rosado, and I'm a public school teacher as well as a WEAC Region 7 member. I'm here today to t uh, ask you guys a question about testing and standardization. Um, school accountability measures based on standardized test scores have been really the only reform that education policymakers have been committed to for the past 20 years. Um, the recently released NAEP scores indicate that even with this decades-long focus on accountability and test scores, scores remain flat. Do you believe that we should continue test-based accountability and why? Who'd like to start? Uh, let's start with Matt. Thank you very much. Thank you and thank you, Earl. Um, there's a place for standardized testing traditionally, the SATs, the ACTs, the LSATs, and so on. When George Bush and the Republicans got in, they put in No Child Left Behind. They have this rigid, mechanistic, anti-education idea that these testing will then spill back on teachers, and teachers, to basically keep their compensation and their, their, their ratings, would teach to the test. I think that is dead wrong. Barack Obama did the right thing in 2015 by passing the All Children Succeed Act, which modified that somewhat. But I do not believe that you can have standardized testing in grade schools and high schools and then somehow judge teachers by that and somehow judge performance only by that. I want fully educated people, and I do not want Republican policies that look at mechanistic standardized testing outside of where it should be, which are the SATs and the ACTs, 
And so I would, uh, in Wisconsin, make it very, very clear, we are not penalizing teachers. We're not doing anything. We're not teaching to the test. We're going to fully educate children. All right. Thank you. Hi. So Andy Gronick. And so my view is that there are objective and subjective ways of measuring. To suggest that all education should be measured objectively, to me, doesn't make any sense. And I'll tell you a story. When my son, who's 13 now, was in first grade, we got a call after about three weeks of the first year from his teacher who said, there's been a, look, a couple of issues on the playground. We'd like to have you come in and, and talk about what's going on with Spence. We met with her, and in about a half an hour, she had told us all kinds of things about how Spencer was motivated, what kinds of things that would help him to learn, the kinds of things that kept him inspired, essentially doing the same thing that teachers, everybody in this room, does with every one of their students all the time. And I left that meeting thinking, oh my gosh, what an amazing teacher. I left that classroom and I wrote a letter to the Department of Education. And I told them at that time, if you want to really make a difference in understanding how education should work in this country, you should be speaking to my first grade student's teacher. That teacher came back to me several years later and said, I'm going to try to apply for, the, for Senator Coles. Uh, I forget what the, the program was called, but I don't want, want to apply. And I was the wondering Herb Cole if, Fellowship. I just Herb, won one. Exactly. And said, I would like to know if you would write me a recommendation. I said, all I really have to do is I have to take that letter that I, that I wrote to the, the, to the secretary of the Department of Education, put a little cover letter on it, and I think you'll do just fine. And she did, and she won. This can't just be about testing objectively. We've got to get back to teaching our kids in that classroom and giving them the kinds of experiential learning that's going to propel our students like it always did into a great future. Thank you. As an educator, one of my concerns is that I do think that people can generally agree that testing and over-testing isn't great. And yet, I don't think that the general public and candidates for political offices really understand the depth of what is going on in terms of what that means in a student's daily experience, what that means in the goals and objectives of a school, what that means in terms of the budget that need, the, the money that has to go to supporting this system that's uh, not effective. And um, could you speak a little bit about, you know, uh, something specific that you believe would be a better use of time, money, or policy than school accountability and standardized test scores? Like, specific. Sure, I'll go ahead and start. I'll tell you that when I spent uh, 18 months uh, talking to over 700 people all over the state before I decided to run, and many of those people were, were teachers, some were students, parents, uh, administrators, you name it. Right now, our teachers in our classrooms are bogged down with so much reporting that takes time away from actually being able to be engaged with students in the classroom. It is unbelievable. I have an eighth grader right now, and I have a fourth grader right now. Both of my kids come back and tell me about the next test that they're doing this week. It's test after test after test. And some of those test results are not even available to teachers for weeks or months. So it's not like this information is going to be adapted into the classroom learning experience so that whatever shortfalls or, or uh, 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 examples of great learning that's happening, that somehow we can build upon those building blocks, that's not the way it's working. So tailoring this back, giving teachers more one-on-one -on -one time in classrooms that are properly sized and so that they can able to provide that one-on-one -on -one real teaching experience that we all know is great in the state of Wisconsin. Those are the kinds of things that I'm going to fight for as governor. Thank you. Yeah, I do have um, personal experience besides talking to many teachers. My wife Mary in Germantown, speech and language therapist, um, was on M teams for 30 years, for more than 30 years, working with children with autism, uh, 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 children with all kinds of disabilities. And the paperwork at the end got so oppressive, it got so mechanistic. I would frankly uh, uh, defer to the expertise and the good faith of teachers. Just like at the state level, I'd restore local control at the university, shared governance. So too with, with high school and grade school teachers, I would say, look, 
uh, I would get rid of a lot of that paperwork, get rid of a lot of the rigid, rigid mechanistic approach to testing, and leave it to the discretion of teachers and principals and local school districts. The truth of the matter is the Republican Party has simply tried to impose standards for fake business reasons, and it doesn't work. All right. Thank you. Hi, I'll have the next question. My name is Tanya Lohr, and I am a social studies teacher at West Bend West High School, um, and I am also the president of our local, the West Bend Education Association. Um, and first, just as kind of, I guess, my own piece of advice is that today, like everybody who's here, we all know that education is important and why education is important, but I think what people are really interested in in terms of distinguishing between the Democratic candidates is we know that education is important, so what are you going to do to make it important in terms of the budget and policy and funding? Um, and my specific question is going to have to do with the growing teacher exodus and the um, ill-fated choice of dropping teacher standards in order to try to address it. Wisconsin is experiencing a dramatic loss of educators due to bad working conditions, declining compensation, and loss of professional respect. Our current governor and legislature believes that the solution to the growing teacher shortage is to lower standards for entering and remaining in the profession, such that people can now become teachers in Wisconsin with absolutely no post-secondary education in teaching and no student teaching or other residency. What will you do to address the exodus of teachers from the profession and reestablish high standards for entering and remaining in the field of education? Uh, let's Sir. begin with Matt Dillon. Thank you very much, Ralph. Yeah. Let me start out by saying this. Um, the first thing that's got to be done, got to be done by any governor, is repeal Act 10. That's got to be done because if we don't repeal Act 10, much of what you've described in the demoralization of teachers and the attack on education is because teachers don't have collective bargaining. Restoring that alone, not just for compensation, but for working conditions, will go a long way. Number two. This business of, of dumbing down licensing, and it's not just happening in the education department, there's proposing it for electricians, plumbers, and everything else, is simply dead wrong. I want to see good, stringent licensing agreements just like we have now. It's the greatest protection for both teachers and the quality of education. And third, most people don't know this, but related to this is there a Republican proposal in the legislature now to um, have teachers um, inform on one another if a, they talk to a student for a non-educational purpose, for violating boundaries, and I'm not talking about physical boundaries, I'm talking about subjective ideas the Republican Party has about what's appropriate for teachers and not. This is becoming like the Soviet Union in the 1960s. This Republican Party is destroying education. I do not say that lightly. This governor left college under humiliating circumstances, and he has devoted his career to attacking and dismantling the greatest university system in the world and attacking and humiliating teachers. And I'm not going to put up with that. And that includes full funding for public education, not private education, not only restoring what he took out, all of it, but increasing it. And number two, deferring to teachers, restoring their morale, uh, stopping this business of shuffling around and, you know, people will bid on a math teacher, they don't want somebody else. That's all going to stop when we restore collective bargaining. Thank you. All right, Andy. Hi, Andy Gronick. Um, so I traveled the state for 18 months, and so many of those conversations I had were with teachers in K through 12 or with university professors, and many of those conversations uh, with people who broke into tears. People who told me that I can no longer tell somebody that I meet that I teach for a living for fear of what they may say to me. The fact that, that those conversations are going on in a state where I have spent my entire life, where I have my kids in public school education, if you want to know what caused somebody who never imagined running for public office to sit before you as a candidate for governor, it's those kinds of conversations. So think about it. Scott Walker came in with a plan to attack teachers because he had no plan to grow our state. He starved the institutions that have forever been a jewel of the state of Wisconsin, K through 12 and our university system, starved them to the point of absolute breaking right now. 
I spent six out of the last eight weeks with students from Stevens Point at rallies, at marches, at listening sessions, because right now they're threatening to, to absolutely do away with 13 liberal arts majors. And they're doing it because of a $250 million cut, followed by a $250 million cut, followed by a tuition freeze. So Governor Walker had no uh, idea whatsoever how to replace that freeze on revenue with the intention of seeing collapse. The bottom line is in K through 12, we have to provide the kind of funding that allows us to restore our public schools to the absolute best choice for all of our kids, period. Well, that funding has to be there. We have to move forward with a one-year school plan that actually deploys uh, the kinds of, of uh, of best practices that are generally acknowledged throughout the country and restore local control in our schools so that our teachers are in the position to use those best practices that they feel actually do the best job for the kids in the classroom. We have to get teachers back to the bargaining table and restore their voice because there is no more important voice in education than the voice of those teachers. There are so many things that are absolutely essential to be done and can be done, but we have to start by restoring the resources that are required to make public school education the very best choice. All right. Thank you very much. Uh, Marva Herndon is our next speaker. Next question. Marva Herndon, Schools and Communities United. Uh, my question I want to ask you is very Mom, important. Yeah, in the microphone. I'm sorry. That's okay. Okay. Our organization had a financial impact study completed on the City of Milwaukee Charter Program. We found out through this research that the City of Milwaukee holds the debt for Milwaukee Public Schools. Do you have a solution to stop the financial destruction of MPS, thus saving the bond rating of the City of Milwaukee? And one of the reasons why that is important is because legislatively, so much legislation has been passed down specifically for getting rid of public education in Milwaukee, specifically to certain zip codes in Milwaukee. That legislation is the omnibus motion number 457, the Opportunity School Partnership Program, item 39. SB 293, AB 383, which reduces the accountability for voucher schools, and then SB 318 outlines in the detail the criteria of demanding MPS school buildings be sold. How could any school system survive under that type of legislation? And it is in effect and we've been suffering under that ever since Act 10. Let's begin with Andy. Sure, so it can't survive under that kind of, it's, that is designed for failure. So again, it's not just about restoring funding, we've gotta stop the expansion of vouchers and have a real plan to do that. Uh, we've gotta make sure that when we talk about funding in general, that we look at some of the challenges that exist at MPS because there are unique challenges and every school district has those. I think it starts with making sure that we've got good prenatal care to make sure that we're actually seeing more children born healthy. But that we with have that legislation in place. Pardon those me? Those things can't happen. This is legislation that is currently in place. And my question was, what would you do about it? Well, we've got to we've got to make some real changes, obviously. So this is this is about having a plan and a vision for a public school. If the legislation's in place, legislation needs to be changed. We need to have a real plan to be able to put the kind of funding and priorities into public schools that are essential, stop the expansion of vouchers, make sure that every kid that needs early childhood education actually has that ability to, to see that and arrive at school on a level playing field. We gotta make sure that kids that are in school that are identified as being at risk have the funding and support to not only help them, but help their families so that we can see kids more engaged in schools. It's looking at the entire system because the system right now and what you're saying is broken. Looking at the whole system, 
making sure that we have the resources, the attention, the best practices, and a plan that will work. That's the kind of detail that you'll see on my website right now at andygronick.com. So yes, the, the kinds of legislation that have been put in place by Scott Walker is intended to break the system. It's intended to privatize the system and push money outside of our public schools. That will change when I'm governor. So, so we've got to go to a break. I'm going to turn it right back over quickly to Tim Slecker. Thank you, Earl. I appreciate it. Um, candidates, before we get, we said we were going to have one more question, but I got a direct question. School choice and private charters. Where are each of you? What should we what should we do? Where are we going with it? What's the future of school choice and private charters in Wisconsin? Matt? Thank you very much, Ralph. I am for public education. I would immediately freeze the expansion of school choice, put a moratorium on it everywhere uh, throughout the state, number one. Number two, um, I, for the existing schools, uh, I don't really want any charter schools that aren't subject to an elected school board. Number three, um, they, uh, these so-called charter and voucher schools that do exist will adhere to the same standards as public schools or they will not be funded, period, end of story. And people say they already are, that's baloney. All of these statutes that the Republicans have passed to privatize education in this state, to make it difficult on public schools, will be uh, overturned and we will set, uh, we'll establish a new statutory structure. Number four, when it comes to MPS, which is the answer before, my wife and I live less than a mile from here. I'm the only candidate in this race that lives in the city of Milwaukee, and I've been here for 40 years or more, number one. Number two, the Republican Party has really attacked Milwaukee, not just education, for over for the entire time they've been in. They have cut funding for MPS, cut funding for the city, and their legislators continually attack. They say, if you can't get your crime under control, we're going to cut you some more. People don't understand that there are kids in MPS who are homeless or come from single parent households and they see their mothers drug tested for food stamps and drug tested for Medicaid. Baloney, a Milwaukee me uh, governor is going to stand up for Milwaukee and make sure all of this gets put aside and gets rescinded. Not going to happen again. But when it comes to vouchers and charter schools, um, the, you know, there are school districts, public school districts get all special ed kids dumped on them because a lot of Charter and voucher schools don't take them. Public schools that are near major hospitals, people will move there just for those services. The state has to directly fund, in my view, special education, directly by the students. We have to budget to the students, not to some business model. And I am full of passion and ideas about this. I'm delighted to be here. But we are going to have a strong recommitment to education and to full funding for the city of Milwaukee when I'm governor. Andy Gronin. Thank you. Hi, so I too believe that we need to make sure that we are funding our public schools. We need to stop the expansion of voucher schools. There has to be a consistent yardstick by which all schools that receive public funding are measured. If you're not proven to be uh, uh, up to the standard of receiving those public funds as we transition away from vouchers altogether, you do not get public funds, period. But there has to be a real plan because here's the reality, and all of you know it, that in eliminating vouchers, that process has to occur over a sunset period. I think it's five years. And over that five-year period, we have to make sure that we're not taking a kid that's receiving a productive and safe educational experience out of a school and bringing them back into a public school until it is their very best choice. I am here as a candidate for governor who's fighting for every single kid, every single kid, because in the end, our education system is about those children. It's about making that experience for every kid in that classroom an important and beneficial experience. There are parents right now that are in this neighborhood that are spending 30 minutes a day taking their kids to a school and 30 minutes to go pick them up because the school that's in their neighborhood two blocks away, they don't think is safe or will provide that same productive experience. That's their reality. So for me as governor, 
I'm going to focus resources on public schools and hear me on this. Stop the expansion of vouchers. Sunset those things over five years. We have a real plan to make it happen. But I'm going to also make sure that we're not taking any kids out of a productive learning environment until that school in their neighborhood is the best choice. Uh, and I will put it, I want to put it in just stark terms here because I did speak to parents all throughout our neighborhood in Milwaukee. And I'll give you two in just blank terms here. Black families are sick of white people telling them where to send their kids to school. That's just the reality. So I am going to be a governor that's going to fight for every kid. We have lost generations, generations of children, and we're not losing another generation on my watch. Thank you, Andy. Thank okay. you. I Go ahead, Gail. I agree with everything you just said. A little said. closer to the microphone, Gail, please. However, what I would like to know is what you plan to do for teachers who are teaching these kids. Are you going to plan to bring back support the unions so that these teachers have a voice in what's going on. We need to be supporting them in every way. We, I know they're there for the children, but we as the state need to support these teachers. So I, what do you plan to do as it pertains to the, to the union? So my answer to you is absolutely. And not only will I support the union, not only do I want people back at the bargaining table, not only was I at the protest yesterday at the Milwaukee Public Museum to support you and to march with you, that's important to me too. But I want to recruit more school teachers that look just like you, African American teachers that are teaching African American children. I want to bring more people into our public schools that can be mentors, that can be role models. That's essential. Listen, it's not that complicated, folks. We need to make sure that we restore teachers' voices in that classroom. We spend more one-on-one -on -one time with those kids, that we have the resources to help kids that are at risk and before we lose another generation of children in my neighborhood, too. I've lived here all 61 years of my life, and I've watched what's happened with, with kids throughout these neighborhoods, our neighborhoods, kids that do not have the kind of bright future that they should have. It's a huge reason I'm here, and it's a huge reason why I tell everybody here in this room that I will not walk away from any one of those kids. We're going to make sure that every public school and every neighborhood school is the best choice for children. We'll put the money in, we'll put the resources to teachers, and we'll make thank, it happen. Thank you, thank you. Uh, Matt, you want to respond? Thank you, yes I do. Uh, I want to put it a little more directly. I will repeal Act 10 as the first thing I do, whatever it takes, whatever it takes with any legislature. Unless you have collective bargaining, unless you stand with unions, uh, we're not going to have reform, number one. Number two, in my administration, as when I was party chair and we were taking positions, there's no legislation that's going to be passed until I have consulted with the, head, the, the leadership of WEAC, the leadership of the American Federation of Teachers, the leadership of the Milwaukee teachers, and the leadership of the Madison teachers. And we will also repeal right to work and restore prevailing wage, and there's going to be nothing passed until I talk to the leadership of the AFL-CIO. I'm a Democrat. I'm a Demo I will be a Democratic governor. And the fact of the matter is that teachers right now have been stripped of all power and, in some respects, dignity. They, they're, they're demoralized in many respects. My wife and many of her colleagues all left Germantown. 300 years of experience left. The best teachers in the state, in my view, because they didn't know about They were stripped of their long-term disability as retirees, but the administrators weren't. So I know what's going on. And I know I'm going to sit down, and if there's any legislation that comes along that is opposed by WEAC, opposed by the AFT, opposed by FALCO, it's not getting in. And I'm going to want to hear what you have to say, and that's what's going to get passed. All right, Sue. Okay. My name is Sue Silverstein. I'm a welding instructor at MATC and a member of AFT 212. In 2011, can you move a little closer to the microphone? In please? 2011, uh, Walker cut the budget for and reduced the funding for technical colleges by 30 percent, and students are suffering because of financial aid problems and student debt problems. Um, the cost of providing 
Free tuition for students would be $50 million per year, and this is not much for success given that the amount of that was paid for um, state corrections in 2017 was $1.2 billion. So what I want to know is if you support free tuition for students for technical college. Right. If I may answer that one, Earl. If you look at my website, forwardflynn.com, that has been my proposal from the beginning of my campaign. The first two years of technical college, public technical college, public uh, two-year uh, colleges and two years universities will be tuition free when I am governor. Uh, it's, they've done it in other states. We can do it in our budget. And here are some facts and figures of what we can do. We should not be giving Foxconn four and a half billion dollars. And when I get in, I will start a litigation to stop it. Uh, I have the expertise from my private law practice to do it. And we're going to get that money back. It's an illegal, unconstitutional contract. We're going to get the billion dollars in Medicaid supplement that he didn't take, the 800 million in training. We're going to get rid of the manufacturer's credit, the 950 million. We're going to restore cash into this economy. And we can do it consistent with our, our present budget. Number two, in addition to technical colleges, I'm going to restore full funding to the University of Wisconsin system. And number three, I am going to legalize marijuana for all purposes, tax it and regulate it, and I am going to empty the jails and prisons of the state of anybody there for a low-level possession offense with no violence. That will save a great deal of money. I've been working with the wisdom people on that, and we will reorient our priorities in the state. Andy? Yeah, so the UW system rolled out a plan where they're offering uh, aid to people who make less than $56,000 a year. What I've said is that plan is possible for higher education in general. I, like Matt, will refer you to my website, which is andygronick.com. You'll see a very detailed and layered plan for education, K-12, through and higher ed. I think it's possible to be able to offer the kind of assistance for people to move on to higher education, especially when they have that kind of a need. And I think that we can provide the funding from private sources uh, to make that possible so it's not a drain on taxpayers. When you talk about the issues overall with education and young people leaving the state, I will simply say this. We have people who are burdened with student debt and young people who are leaving the state of Wisconsin, and we have an aging population. If you want to talk about two simple trends that represent a cliff for the state of Wisconsin, those are it. We have a governor right now that's spending $6.8 million to slap ads on the sides of trains in Chicago to try to recruit young people back. That to me is not a plan. A plan is, let's go back and recruit those young people. Let's tell young graduates, come back to the state of Wisconsin. Live here and work here for a minimum of six months. And instead of paying the state of Wisconsin income tax, you can apply that very same amount to paying down your student debt for each and every year that you're employed and living full time in the state of Wisconsin. Now let me tell you what that does. That tells young people, number one, you're important to our state. We want you to be the architects. We want you to have a real stake in the future of Wisconsin. It also gives every business in the state of Wisconsin a recruiting and a retention tool so that those young people come everywhere in our state. They put down roots. They contribute to the economy. And now those young, bright minds are contributing to, to creating new businesses and new jobs all over the state of Wisconsin. That's the kind of future that I envision, and that's what I'll do as your governor. Thank you, Andy. So, WEAC Region 7, thank you so much for being one of the biggest sponsors. And Ted Craig, you being WEAC Region 7, come on up here, buddy. You're next. Thank you. So, the next question I have to say, uh, pay attention, because the first panel didn't quite get it. It's actually not necessarily about what's going on in the walls of a school. Second thing I just want to point out is there's very few people, Republican or Democrat, who have a really compelling answer on this. So I'm very interested to hear what, what you guys have to say. The percentage of students in Wisconsin who are economically disadvantaged has more than doubled since 2000. There exists an almost absolute correlation between poverty, family health, other socioeconomic factors, and the educational success of our children, yet public schools are often blamed for disparities in educational outcomes. They didn't cause these disparities for the most part. As governor, what would you push specifically? What programs, policies would you push 
to dramatically reduce poverty and racial disparities in wealth and income so that all Wisconsin's children have an opportunity to succeed? Sure. Want me to begin? Yes. You already cast the gauntlet. So I think it's, it's really looking at the entire system. So we got to make sure that people actually have an opportunity to go on to a good paying job. With that, we can have regional jobs training programs, let's say here in Milwaukee, commercializing the concept of urban agriculture as a jobs plan, not as a food plan, and targeting families and paying them a living wage, not threatening them like Governor Walker does with loss of food programs and drug testing, but a living wage to acquire life skills and job skills that are applicable to going on to a real job here in their community or anywhere in the state of Wisconsin. That will energize our economy in two ways. One, it takes people off government assistance, and it also energizes businesses throughout the state of Wisconsin who can now grow with the people who need them. So that's the job side. On the education side, I've already talked about it. We need to make sure that, that babies that are being born are born healthy, that we have early childhood education, that we have links, bridges to, to kids that are at risk, and the money to make sure that we can help the kids and help the families. We gotta make sure that this, uh, the food programs that Governor Walker thinks are not important, free and reduced lunch, are not only available to kids in this neighborhood, but are available to them uh, when school's not in session. Those kids are just as hungry on the weekends and uh, uh, on the holidays as they are during school. So listen, we have, I think, the third highest graduation rate in 2015 and 16 for white students and the second uh, lowest graduation rate for black students. That's our Wisconsin. That has to change. So it's not just schools, it's schools, economy, it's having the kind of support that's required to see that kids and families go on to success. Matt? The this morning I had breakfast at Mr. Perkins restaurant, 20th and Atkinson. I've lived in this city all my life, my adult life. This is the most hyper segregated city in the country. When it comes to solving the ill, the, the evil of racism, we could be here a long time and, and it's the most important issue really in society. I want to talk about economic opportunity for people in this city. The tra fact of the matter is, as governor, even with a Republican legislature, I have the executive order power. I can mandate hiring on state jobs that will be fully diverse. I can sit down with industry in the state and in the city. For instance, Northwestern Mutual, when it built this building, did a wonderful job on that in terms of diverse hiring. And the, the glass work was done right here in the city. It was cruel of Scott Walker to turn down that 800 million in train money. Those trains would have been constructed at 35th and Capitol in the former A.O. Smith plant that has sustained generations. Ali Thompson, my friend, many people, sustained many people with, large, with good salaries. Obviously, getting rid of right to work and restoring prevailing wage when union wages go up and African Americans in unions, non-union wages go up, I would raise the minimum wage. And the fact is that we're going to have to have a, firing pro a hiring program, a hiring program funded by the state that um, to, to restore and to rebuild the infrastructure of the state, the roads in the state, and that is going to be absolutely diverse. I want to put to work people in Milwaukee who all want to work and have been discriminated against in employment. Cash comes first, jobs come first, economic opportunity comes first, because you have the ability to spend money, people want your money, and they'd be darn glad to see you. Thank you, Matt. Thank you. Earl. Man, what a great show we are doing here. Earl Ingram, Resistance Radio, Busted Pencils, what a great afternoon. Thank you, everybody, for coming and being part of this episode. We are... Yeah. We yeah. Tim, we've, we got, are, we've got eight minutes left. Yeah, we, we... And so, as the candidates think about this, we've had some time. Um, one interesting fact is, is we've talked about the teacher exodus and things like that, and I want, I want a quick decision on this. Um, teachers who leave and or who are forced out with a license, should they be hired back somewhere else? And how will you help school districts that can't afford them pay for the teachers that have a license but can't be paid by that district? One minute. Okay, if I can just respond first, and I, I want to repeat this again. 
The first thing that I will do as governor of Wisconsin, with all of the power that available to me, is repeal Act 10. If you have collective bargaining before the Act 10, uh, that was, was, was treated in, with collective bargaining. Absent collective bargaining, I would do this. I do not believe in broad licenses. We, uh, they're trying to get rid of licenses. That's what the Republicans are trying to do, to let people come in without any credentials whatsoever and compete. That will not happen under me. But if somebody is a very, very good grade school teacher and wants to go to middle school, that kind of thing, given their experience, I'm not talking about unqualified substitutes. That's not what I'm talking about. I want to make sure those people get rehired. When it comes to uh, wealthy school districts poaching from poorer school districts, we're going to require a different formula, quite frankly. The idea is to give more money to schools with lower property tax valuations, but it's a broken system. That's got to be redone so that more money really does go to the schools with lower property valuation to be able to compete. Andy? And, I'm sorry, yeah? Yeah, I want, I want to just oh, one oh, Andy, minute so we can get Andy? Me. Sure, Andy. So, you know, so many of these questions come down to funding, absolutely. We have to make sure that we actually appropriately and fully fund our public schools. When you talk about licensing, yes, and I didn't get a chance to actually get to the question on licensing, but what Governor Walker has done is said, you can just be a less experienced teacher and still do the job. Well, we all know that that's not true in any profession. In my very first week as a candidate for governor, and I was, I think, the second guy in this race, I was on TV and I said, very simply, we will put the entire compensation plan back on the table. We have to have inspired educators and inspired education. Making sure that there is that voice, absolutely critical. But the, but the issue does not just reside here in Milwaukee. Go to Hayward, okay? Go to Hayward, Wisconsin. They have a $2 million, they're $2 million short in their budget today as to where they were when Governor Walker took over in 2011. $2 million short. When they put an ad out for a teacher, they might get one, two, maybe three applicants. They spend a lot of time and a lot of money training up that teacher, and as soon as they're trained, they get scooped up by Wausau. That's happening all over the state of Wisconsin. So. We need to make sure that our teachers are not only trained and have the certifications and the licensing, but we want to inspire them to go on to additional training and additional education. So all of that value that they learn through their own education is translated to kids in the classroom. Unfortunately, right. we've only got yeah. two minutes left, so each one of you. Last, uh, has, last comment, yeah. Mr. Flynn. Thank you very much. Uh, this is Matt Flynn. I'm delighted to be here, and I want to say this. On the ship I was on in the Navy, we had sailors from Mississippi and Alabama, California, New York, Minnesota, Wisconsin. We had no north-south divide. We had no racial divide. We had no uh, urban-rural divide. We were shipmates. We stood watch together. We went on liberty together. We worked together. And everybody in this audience today is my shipmate, and everybody in the state is my shipmate. I will unify this state. I'll unify the Democratic Party, as I did before when I was chairman. And I see a bright future going forward. The cancer of what Walker and Trump have done is going to be corrected. But going forward, a good, strong Democratic governor rolling his sleeves up will change the state and change the course of this ship. Thank you very much for being Andy. here. Andy. So this is, uh, this is Andy Gronick. I, want, I would like to ask everybody listening on the radio and everybody in the audience, who thinks politics as usual is working? Anybody? Nobody does. And nobody ever does, and I'm sure nobody listening to the radio show does either. So what I would ask you is this. If government, if politics as usual is not working, and we've lost to Scott Walker three times in a row, and I believe everybody in this crowd wants to take Scott Walker out, which is why I am here, why would we continue doing the same thing over and over and over again and expect different results? I'll tell you this. We have a lot of great candidates in this race, and a lot of them are establishment Dems. I am the only person who comes into this space from the outside. We have a very clear route to victory, but we do need your support. This has to be about not doing the same thing over and over again. So I will say simply this. I am the outsider in the race. I am. 
I am classically uh, equipped to go toe-to-toe -to -toe with Scott Walker and have his Open for Business Wisconsin debate. We need to win. I am a former middle linebacker, and I do know how to take my opponents down. So thank you very much. <laughs>